presentation of the Freeman Center seminar series on global policy. I'm Bob Cooterley of the Humphrey School, and our speaker today is the new dean of the Humphrey School, Eric Schwartz. Prior to his arrival in Minnesota in October of 2011, Dean Schwartz was U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration. From August 2005 through January of 2007, he served as UN Secretary General Kofi Annan's Deputy Special Envoy for Tsunami Recovery. Before that appointment, Dean Schwartz was a lead expert for the congressionally mandated Mitchell Gingrich Task Force on UN Reform. Prior to that, in 2003 and 2004, he served as the second ranking official at the office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. From 1993 to 2001, Dean Schwartz served on the National Security Council at the White House, ultimately as Senior Director and Special Assistant to the President for Multilateral and Humanitarian Affairs. He managed responses on international humanitarianism, human rights, and rule of law issues, and he led the White House review that resulted in President Clinton's decision to sign the Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court. From 2001 through 2003, Dean Schwartz held fellowships at the Woodrow Wilson Center, the U.S. Institute for Peace, and the Council on Foreign Relations. During this period, he also served as a contributor to the Responsibility to Protect project of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty. From 1989 to 1993, our speaker served as staff consultant to the U.S. House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asian and Pacific Affairs. Prior to his work on the subcommittee, he was Washington director of the human rights organization Asia Watch, which is now known as Human Rights Watch Asia. He holds a law degree from New York University School of Law, a Master of Public Affairs degree from Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, a Bachelor of Arts degree with honors in political science from the State University of New York at Binghamton. Between 2001 and 2009, he was a visiting lecturer at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. The Humphrey School is very fortunate to have Eric Schwartz as its dean, and we look forward to his talk today, which is entitled The Responsibility to Protect Rhetoric, Reality, and the Role of Norms in Protecting Basic Rights. Uh, thanks, Bob, for that um, overly extensive introduction. Uh, but thank you. Anyway. Um, <coughs> This is more, of a, I would call this more of a, of a reflection uh, um, than a, um, a finely honed uh, speech. Um, but when, and, and the, the, the advantages or maybe the disadvantages of having a career in which you um, uh, have occupied different you know, disciplines essentially. Uh, is that when you get invited to speak at the Freeman uh, uh, seminar, you have to think, should I talk about humanitarian assistance? Should I talk about refugees? Should I talk about peacekeeping? Um, should I talk about migration? Um, all things, you know, my knowledge is a mile wide, wide and about uh, two inches deep. Um, but what I thought I would talk about is um, is uh, the responsibility to protect, and um, and the role of of, of norms uh, in protecting basic rights in the context of uh, humanitarian intervention. This this is a, a presentation on international law, uh, and it's 
uh, I'll lay my cards out on the table. It's a pro-international law uh, presentation. I, I don't know whether international law is going to be part of the presidential campaign. Uh, but I do know uh, a, a statement recently by <coughs> candidate uh, um, Newt Gingrich that, that if uh, he would accept the position, uh, John Bolton would be the Secretary of State in a, in a Gingrich administration. I also note parenthetically that, that uh, John Bolton endorsed uh, um, uh, Mitt Romney the other day, so I don't know how that's going to work, but, um, but I, 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 I myself note, noted that announcement with some interest because uh, I may have been the, the National Security Council staff member most responsible for uh, the review that led to President Clinton's decision to sign the International Criminal Court Treaty, and John Bolton, whom I know and whose views, frankly, I find provocative and interesting on international uh, law, has indicated that the happiest moment, the happiest moment of his political career was acting to renounce U.S. signature of the Rome Statute uh, uh, at the United Nations. Um, so beyond any uh, personal interest that I have in this issue, it's fair to say that, um, that former Ambassador Bolton uh, uh, among others, has decidedly skeptical views about international uh, law, and of course, uh, and of course, even more skeptical views uh, on issues of of war, of of the application of international law, the relevance of international law in those areas that involve uh, war and peace, um, uh, high politics, and the application of power. Um, so, that, so that's the issue I want to take on, the, the role of international law in the promotion of, of human rights, in particular with respect to international humanitarian intervention uh, to end uh, the most egregious forms of human rights abuses. And I want to start by defining the term, or at least talking about a definition of a term. One analyst refers to humanitarian intervention as a state using military force against another when the chief publicly declared aim of that military action is ending human rights violations being perpetrated by the state against which it is directed. Um, I think of it not dissimilarly as actions authorized and implemented by foreign governments, outside governments, or international organizations that are designed to save lives and which involve measures that are traditionally within the, the sovereign authority uh, of the affected state. And in recent years and decades, we've seen uh, such humanitarian interventions in the Balkans, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, uh, in East Timor, although East Timor it, it deserves a little asterisk because that was an intervention that took place with the acquiescence of the government of Indonesia uh, following uh, uh, um, uh, election related. Uh, violence uh, in uh, East Timor in 1999. Um, the most recent example, of course, is Libya. Um, and in considering the prospects for a successful, and of course we can talk about what, what it means to, be, to have a successful intervention, but however you define a successful humanitarian intervention, in considering the prospects for successful interventions, there are several critical issues uh, to be explored, examined. One is legitimacy. Uh, uh, another is capacity. Can we prevail in terms of the objectives that we've articulated, and can we sustain um, uh, the the, um, the the effort uh, uh, over time? Capacity and necessity. How critical is it uh, to to act to end the suffering? And I'm I'm more than uh, happy to talk when we, when we discuss about, um, about capacity and necessity. But I want to focus much of my talk on legitimacy today. And let me tell you why. First, it's a, it's a, it's a key ingredient for success in enabling, in effecting, and sustaining successful actions 
to save lives. And because it's closely connected to and dependent upon the development of norms of international human rights law. So what is it? What is legitimacy? Um, I would suggest that it is, it is a state of rightfulness. Um, rightfulness which is broadly perceived as rightful by the relevant body politic, political leadership, and other key stakeholders. In life um, and in society, much of what's lawful is often legitimate, and law is a critical tool for the establishment of legitimacy. But sometimes that which is lawful might not be so legitimate, and vice versa. Uh, and that's simply because while law is a series of rules and guidelines that are enforced by political institutions, it's not, law is not always, it doesn't always reflect a broadly accepted state of rightfulness. There's a close uh, relationship between law and legitimacy, but they're not one and the same. Uh, in Syria, much of the apparatus and uh, activities of state repression right now, in some instances, or in some sense, might be considered uh, in compliance with a law of sorts, but they're not so legitimate. Uh, um, on the other hand, um, in many countries, or in Syria, in Syria, um, protests might have a great deal of legitimacy, broadly perceived as rightful, but are not so lawful. Um, and in, in international relations, um, lawfulness and legitimacy are closely related, but not always the same. For example, uh, a number of governments in recent years have called for expansion of the Security Council. Uh, that, isn't, that isn't an argument about the lawfulness of current Security Council actions, but rather it's, uh, it's an argument about legitimacy, about the acceptability of, of um, essentially five permanent members that can, that can obtain a particular votes um, the, the support of a few others making decisions for a world community uh, in which power is effectively, increasingly um, uh, dispersed. That argument is, is an argument about, about legitimacy. Um, but whatever the interplay between these concepts of law and legitimacy, the fact is that the development of international legal instruments what you might call, what I might call, I don't know if you would call it that, but what I might call the, the gelling of advocacy efforts and politics into rules established by international organizations, they've, had, they've played an important enabling role in this, in this area. And the key to understanding about the evolution of any doctrine that enables humanitarian intervention is an appreciation of legitimacy and the critical role of international norms and international law both as the product of a process of legitimation and a critical tool itself in sustaining and promoting a broad perception of the rightfulness of, of international action. So let me move from the conceptual to um, uh, a, little bit of, a, a little bit of history. In large measure, this discussion of humanitarian intervention and legitimacy in recent years grew out of experiences in three places. In Rwanda, in Srebrenica, and in Kosovo. In Rwanda, in 1994, after the downing of and the killing of the presidents of Rwanda and Burundi in April of 1994, uh, there was a spasm of, of, of violence. Uh, hundreds, many, many hundreds of thousands of people were killed, as you know, um, in, a, in, a, in a mass genocide in which there was an enormous <coughs> amount of debate about what the world, about what other governments of the world knew, about when they knew it. Um, there was a lot of disagreement on, on, on those basic issues, but there was, I think, little disagreement there, was, there may have been disagreement about how many lives could have been saved. There were. There, were, there, was, there were pitch disagreements.
But I don't think there was any disagreement that tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lives could have been saved by stronger international action. Even, a, even a, uh, 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 an article by a, uh, a scholar, Alan Kupperman, I believe, um, uh, suggested that the harshest critics were overstated. I believe that article suggested that you know, as many as 100,000 lives could have been saved. And that was, that was a, um, a, 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 in the grand scheme of things, a conservative estimate. But there was no serious intervention. And ultimately, it took the uh, forces of the Rwandan uh, Patriotic Front uh, to, to end the violence. And this was widely seen as a dramatic failure of the international community. Um, similarly, in uh, about a year later, in July 1995, in Srebrenica, uh, there was a massacre, as many of you undoubtedly recall, of a beleaguered Muslim population, estimates of many, many thousands of, of uh, Bosnian uh, men uh, and others uh, killed uh, with little willingness on the part of uh, Dutch peacekeepers or the international community to take serious action to prevent the slaughter, largely seen as a, as a failure of the international community. Those, those, those two events, I think it had enormous impact on the thinking in international organizations, uh, in governments, about responsibilities to respond that perhaps not perhaps, but we're not mad. Um, by contrast, in Kosovo in 1999, uh, in the face of large-scale uh, human rights violations by Serbian forces uh, uh, against Kosovars in that territory, in Serbia, um, the governments of the NATO alliance agreed to intervene. Um, and there's a lot of discussion and debate about the impact of that uh, humanitarian intervention. But the goal was uh, to end the human rights violations by the Serbian authorities um, and, um, and to protect the people of Kosovo. The significance of that action, though, in this context, or a significant element of that action in this context was it took place without the sanction of the Security Council, and, uh, and, in, and uh, under international law, under broadly accepted principles of international law, unless you are involved in a, in a, in a clear case of self-defense, uh, such military intervention, uh, the conventional wisdom goes, would require a sanction by the Security Council uh, to be consistent with internationally recognized norms relating to the use of force. Um, so the, after Srebrenica and after Rwanda, Kosovo brought home a, a critical dilemma or issue, and that of the, the, the question of the moral imperative versus the issue of the right authority. And in short, having both on your side is pretty good for legitimacy. If you have the right authority and you have the moral imperative, you're in pretty good shape. Um, but having one or the other uh, is only partial, is only, is, is only, is inadequate. And, um, and the issue is not, is not trivial because uh, for those who, who, who believe that this sort of intervention should be an option, um, in the most dire circumstances, because legitimacy matters, as as we all as we all know, uh, in the first Gulf War, um, the secure the United States um, led international efforts actions against uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, invasion of Kuwait, um, with the full authority of the United Nations, with Security Council authorization for the use of force. And I think the most graphic evidence of the legitimacy of the action and the support that the action had was um, the fact that over, over 
that of the just over $60 billion in the estimated costs of that conflict, some 50, mil some 50 billion or more came from governments other than the United States, um, not only Gulf states. That was just one in indicator of the extent of support and legitimacy for international action at that point. Um, the, the, the Iraq War um, uh, is a very different experience in terms of international legitimacy. Uh, fewer countries participated. Uh, as much as several trillion dollars have been spent, mostly on our, we've spent it mostly on our own. Um, without, um, I, I think you know, there is, uh, U.S. officials fairly point to um, uh, non-trivial support from the international community, but it was of a different order uh, than the support that um, that uh, that what that the United States had. Uh, in the first Gulf War. Um, and, and legitimacy impacts not only your capacity to act in the first place, but your capacity to sustain your action with the support of other governments whose participation can be so helpful. So if this, is the, if this was the, 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 the dilemma, the dilemma of the moral imperative versus the right authority, um, how to go about trying to address this, this challenge. And uh, in 1999, the Secretary General, Kofi Annan, in his speech before the General Assembly, said, and I quote, the Kosovo conflict and its outcome have prompted a wide debate of profound importance to the resolution of conflicts from the Balkans to Central Africa to East Asia. And to each side in this critical debate, difficult questions will be posed can be posed. To those for whom the greatest threat to the future of international order is the use of force in the absence of Security Council mandate, one might ask, not in the context of Kosovo, but in the context of Rwanda, if in those dark days and hours leading up to the genocide, a coalition of states that had been prepared to act in defense of the Tutsi population, but did not receive prompt council authorization, should such a coalition have stood outside and allowed the horror to unfold. So for proponents of so-called right authority, uh, the Secretary General asked the obvious question. If you can save a life, or if you can save hundreds of thousands of lives, how could you not act? And then, he, and then in turn, he said, to those for whom the Kosovo action heralded a new era when states and groups of states can take military action outside the established mechanisms for enforcing international law, one might ask, is there not a danger of such interventions undermining the imperfect yet resilient security system carried, created after the Second World War and of setting dangerous precedents for future interventions without a clear criterion to decide who might invoke these precedents and in what circumstances? So he asked the other question. For proponents of the moral imperative, um, if you act wherever your, 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 your heart takes you on humanitarian intervention, what about this fragile security system? And in his Millennium Address to the UN General Assembly, he said, how should, if, if intervention is indeed an unacceptable assault on sovereignty, how should we respond to a Rwanda, to a Srebrenica, to gross and systematic violations of human rights that affect every precept of our common humanity? So there's the challenge. There's the challenge. The challenge to bring together moral imperative and right authority. And so in the decade of the uh, following 1999, how, do we, how did the international community, how did governments of the world um, uh, go about this task? And what has been the impact? Uh, there have been a number of, of means to try to tackle this. There was, rhetor there was um, rhetoric on behalf of principles, which in and of itself uh, uh, can, be, can play a role in the creation of, 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 of norms. Not adequate by itself, 
but the whole process of developing shared consensus on the way ahead starts with government saying, or individuals saying, or influential institutions saying the way things ought to be. President Clinton in June of 1999 said in Macedonia, quote, if somebody comes out after innocent civilians and tries to kill them en masse because of their race, their ethnic background, or their religion, and it's within our power to stop it, we will stop it. One can question the ability of a government to assume such a responsibility over time, but, that, but, but at that time in our history, we heard that kind of um, those kinds of exhortations about the moral imperative of action. Um, there can, secondly, there were efforts to carve out, to develop new and novel uh, norms, norms agreed upon, uh, agreed, uh, agreed upon um, um, measures that over time, uh, to use a term I, I, I used before, gel into what we can call um, law and, and legal obligations. And so, so how was the, so, so governments of the world who decided they were going to intervene in Kosovo, they had to articulate a rationale for that intervention. And, and in fact, um, um, in fact, if you look at statements from the United States government at the time, kind of difficult to identify the legal rationale that was articulated for the action. U.S. officials said the action was legitimate, it was, um, it was appropriate, um, but there, there were not detailed legal rationales. And we can speculate as to why. We can discuss that. But in the, in the United Kingdom, there was a much, more seri a much more consistent effort to try to articulate standards um, to make the case that the Kosovo intervention may well have been legal, um, uh, may, may well have been a legal action. Um, and, um, and, and at the time, coming from the United Kingdom, you saw statements about um, the circumstances that justified, as a matter of law, the intervention. Overwhelming humanitarian necessity, where in light of all circumstances, the limited use of force is the only way to avert a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, uh, Prime Minister at the time, Tony Blair, gave a speech about six hours from here. I think that's Chicago's about six hours from here. About six hours from here at the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations in 1999, in which he said it, it, it can be legitimate, it can be, can be legal to intervene to stop genocide or massive flows of refugees due to threats of international peace and security. It's very interesting that when he articulated this standard, he stuck, he stuck very close to language that we see in the UN Charter, right? Um, due, to, uh, to, uh, uh, due to threats to international peace and security, and also it's okay, it, it, it's permissible to stop genocide. Of course, there is a genocide convention which imposes on governments obligations uh, to, to take action against genocide. So in, 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 in Tony Blair's effort to promote the legitimacy of this kind of intervention, what does he do? He does what he should have done. Is he, 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 he takes recourse to um, established international um, uh, a law uh, and international uh, uh, instruments. Um, and the standards that he suggested at the time were if you're sure of the case, if you've exhausted diplomatic options, if we can be sensibly and prudently uh, achieving military objectives, if we're prepared for the long term, and if, and if the action meets national interests. At, the, at about the same time, I was at the National Security Council. And we, we got visited by, I don't, I, don't, I don't know whether this has been written about um, before, but, but we were visited at the National Security Council at the White House by officials from the government of the United Kingdom. And they were, I would, it was, I would call it a trip in search of legitimacy, because they, um, they, were, they were talking to us about um, the circumstances that the that governments of the world, they were talking about 
governments of the world coming together to talk about the circumstances that would permit, um, clearly and unequivocally in international law, um, uh, humanitarian intervention. The suggestion that was made at the time was perhaps if uh, members of the Security Council could reach agreement on principles, on certain criteria that would justify Security Council action in favor of intervention, then when the world faced a humanitarian crisis with grave implications for loss of life, if, we, if, if you had recourse to those principles, getting the vote in the Security Council would be politically more manageable. Since you had prior, you might have prior agreement on what those, on what those criteria might be. And then, in the event that, that you couldn't reach agreement, if governments decided to take action without Security Council authorization, their action would have a greater indicia of legitimacy by virtue of those very principles. These were the kinds of ideas that were being discussed in the, in, you know, at, at, at the turn of the century, if you will, um, in the effort to explore ways to promote this principle. And then, of course, um, uh, in 1999 or 2000, uh, the, um, the government of Canada, Canada supported by a number of foundations, established the uh, International Commission on uh, Intervention and State Sovereignty, uh, chaired by former Foreign Minister Gareth Evans and um, Al Al the former Algerian diplomat and UN official Mohamed Sanoun, uh, to explore this issue. And a couple of Americans were on that panel, Lee Hamilton, um, uh, Indiana and Michael Ignatieff, uh, um, and, um, and, and the report that they produced was a report, uh, a, a document which urged the evolution of a, of a, of a principle of the responsibility to protect, uh, to prevent actions that would result in large-scale loss of life uh, through by conflict, to react to such, um, to such occurrences, and to rebuild after disaster. Um, and, um, uh, and, and the, the focus was action in response to large-scale loss of life, to large-scale ethnic cleansing. Um, they, they, they articulated their objectives and their principles that were based on the obligations of sovereignty but they define sovereignty not, sovereignty not only as the ability of governments and leaders of governments to determine the affairs of their state without fear of interference from the outside, the traditional concept of sovereignty, but they also articulated the principle of the responsibility of the sovereign. The requirement of the sovereign to the, the, the obligations that the sovereign has to the people of the country, and um, and um, uh, uh, and the 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 principles that, that that guide that guided their approach on this issue is were that if a sovereign government was unwilling or unable uh, to meet those fundamental obligations, and there was the threat of wide, widespread loss of uh, then there would that there are circumstances that would justify um, intervention. Uh, the principles to guide this decision making, as far as this commission was were concerned, was concerned, was the intention of the intervention, the fact that intervention would be action of the last resort, that the means would be proportional, and that there would be reasonable prospects for success. Um, very interesting. The commission had to address the issue of the authority for action, right? So, under the criteria established, would intervention need to need or require Security Council authorization? Yes or no? This whole challenge between the moral imperative on the one hand and right authority on the other. And my own view, you may have different views, those of you who have read the report, who's read the report? If you've read the report, Anyone? Raise your hand if you 
well, okay, good. So I'm, I can make stuff up. Um, um, but but the, the, my own view on this question of moral authority versus, uh, um, uh, moral imperative versus right authority, the, the, the commission essentially, I think, kind of punted. Because what they said was that, of course, Security Council authorization for the use of force under Chapter 7 of the UN Security Council, which is, for the last many, many decades, since the end of World War II, since the establishment of the United Nations, that has been the, 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 um, uh, the requirement for the use of force in international, international law. That is very desirable. And, and the Perm Five, the Permanent Five, members of the Permanent Five should not veto a resolution if the objective, if the, these criteria are met, and if the objective is to save lives. Um, and, um, and, and, and the, the commission said they should do the right thing. But then the commission went on to say, um, um, that, well, then they said if not, if, if the council doesn't act, there are other legal means that can be taken to, uh, to promote uh, uh, the, the, the desired objective. For example, um, the council under the charter, uh, with council approval, and what, and, uh, with council approval, regional organizations can act. And there's been some debate about what council approval means with respect to regional organizations acting. So, there are, so, so the commission said, and you're going to do other legal means. But what if none of that works? Then what? And what they said was, if none of that works, if, 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 there's a, if, if a government with veto power on the Security Council decides that they're going to prevent a critical humanitarian intervention that really should be taking place, then council, you only have yourself to blame if a, if, a, if a member state decides they have to go it alone to save lives, right? So essentially, uh, what the commission said was just what I said. And they were sort of, so their position on this issue was somewhat ambiguous. And I was just, as, I was re as I've read this many times over the course of my career, I've, I've wondered, gee, it would have been nice to be a fly on that wall of that discussion within the commission. Because I, my own view, my own guess is that it, ref it reflected some debate back and forth with some members saying, absolutely, it has to be um, the council's approval under any circumstances. And others saying, but what if the council isn't prepared to do the right thing? So what has been the impact uh, of, and I'm, I'm turning the corner here. So for those of you who are not nodding off, I just want to let you know that. Um, so what has been the outcome of this? You know, has, has this responsibility to protect doctrine um, influenced the behavior of states? And my, my argument is that, that it has, that it has. And on balance, probably for the better. Uh, first, by becoming more a, part of, a, more a part of a normative structure. And second, and connected to my first point, by uh, impacting practice. Um, and it's, it's moved the ball forward, in my view, by enhancing, in certain instances, the legitimacy of, of intervention in, 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 in very particular cases where lives are at stake, and therefore its availability as an option. In two, so let me talk a little bit about how all that has, uh, has come about. In 2005, the Secretary General issued a major report called In, in Larger Freedom, in anticipation or in, in the advance of the um, uh, World Summit uh, um, that took place in 2005. And in that report, the Secretary General himself endorsed the norm and urged member states to do so. And that very same year, the UN General Assembly uh, stated in the World Summit outcome document uh, that they endorsed uh, this principle. And it was actually interesting. It was, it was they endorsed it with language that was very similar to the language I, um, I um, uh, uh, not identical, but very similar to the language that I discussed with you just before about what the government of Britain was proposing uh, at, at, in 1999 and 2000, or if not proposing, at least discussing. Um, in, in April of 2006, um, the. The United Nations Security Council endorsed the principle in, uh, um, in a resolution 
And much more significantly, we've seen the resolution, um, we, we've seen the, the, the inclusion of the responsibility to protect as a justification or rationale for uh, uh, action on international peace and security issues. In, um, in, in the case of Darfur, for example, UN Resolutions 1706 in 2006 and 1769 in 2007, numbers which you don't need to remember, um, but the resolutions that involved the deployment of peacekeepers to help save lives. Now, we can discuss just how effective those deployments have been. Uh, we can discuss um, uh, whether how much of a difference they've really made. Uh, but my own view is that the, the inclusion of, of this principle as a, as a justifying element in a decision of an international organization to, to deploy peacekeepers on behalf of international peace and security is quite significant. And of course, the latest case in Libya, and um, as Libyan troops were marching towards Benghazi, there is no question that thousands, if not tens of thousands of people were at risk. I was in the government at the time. That was certainly based on the information I was getting day in and day out. That was certainly my perception. And many of us uh, um, were very strongly supportive of intervention to save lives. Um, and and um, deliberations within the government were focused largely, if not primarily, if not exclusively, on the need to protect civilians. And, um, and of course, the this, this Security Council resolution that emerged, Security Council Resolution 1973, mentioned the responsibility to protect, mentioned protection of civilians, and, um, and helped to enable decision makers created a climate in which um, created a climate in which decision makers not only could feel free or freer to make that very difficult decision to deploy force, but in some sense might have might have felt a greater sense of obligation or to use the word the term of art responsibility in this case. Um, th this doesn't this doesn't uh, by by these comments I don't mean to ignore uh, the complications and the contradictions of this, um, uh, you know, of, of these approaches, um, and there are several. For example, um, the responsibility to protect doctrine talks about protecting civilians, and many critics of the of the Libyan intervention say, "Well, this was much more than protection of civilians. You were in there to change a government." The rebuttal to that might be. If you weren't prepared to sustain your engagement, then there would have been no enduring protection for civilians. Um, but it, it is fair to argue, one could fairly argue, that the actions of the international community may have gone beyond the, the four walls of, of the responsibility to protect doctrine. Um, others would say, and I think I would put myself in the category of others, that if protection of civilians requires a more enduring presence, well, so be it. Um, the, other, uh, the other contradiction or issue in, uh, with this doctrine is, what do we mean by responsibility to protect? I is it really the responsibility? If it's a responsibility, then it's broad-based, then it's comprehensive, and then it requires you to act wherever those criteria come, uh, come into effect. But, but, but is it really a responsibility if you only are prepared to take this sort of action in certain kinds of cases? That's a, and again, I have my own views on the answer to that question, but it's a very fair and, and difficult question. Um, and then, of course, as the members of the commission emphasized, uh, the, the, this notion, this principle of the responsibility to protect does not, should not mean that your first recourse is to a military intervention. Uh, and there are places in the world where military intervention is not the right, in fact, maybe the wrong play, the, the wrong way in which to address long-standing political uh, uh, challenges. Uh, the, the jury is still out, for example, on South Sudan. Uh, it's a very fragile new government in the world. 
but as some of you may know, that political dispensation did not come about as a result of the intervention, but rather has come about as a result of a process of negotiation. Um, nonetheless, I think it is fair to say that the development and the evolution of international legal instruments on this, um, on this issue both results from a broad perception about the rightness under certain circumstances of interventions and enables consideration of resort to that options when situations so compel. And this, I think, reflects a positive development overall in the effort to save and uh, safeguard lives over time. Thank you. We have time for questions and comments. Could you please identify yourself before you about speaking? Could you please identify yourself before speaking? Uh, we have quite a bit of time for questions and comments. My name is Fadia. I'm from Syria. I am Humphrey Fellow, International Humphrey Fellow here. And I have been here in USA six months ago, and I was one of the protesters in Syria, and I am jeopardizing my family life and put my family life at risk by speaking about Syria. I would like just to ask you, please, why you are, in your point of view, considering our movement and our revolution in Syria is not legitimate and we don't have a law full of our movement exactly the same as Libyan. And why until now USA doesn't take any movement like, like exactly the movement and what NATO did in Libya? Thank you. Well, let me, let me first clarify to be sure that you didn't misunderstand what I said about Syria. Um, what I said was that the, that the apparatus and activities of state repression may be in some sense consistent with state laws, but they're not legitimate. They are not legitimate. And, um, and that the protests, while protesters may in some sense be violating some sort of Syrian law, those protesters have an enormous amount of legitimacy within the society. So I, 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 I'm not suggesting that you misunderstood what I said, but I just want to make sure that, that there be no misunderstanding about what I said. Um, I think that um, uh, I think that right now um, the, 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 the challenge in Syria uh, uh, involves um, promoting. Uh, first of all, you, your question really is how does the international, how do the governments of the world and the people of the world best um, um, uh, support uh, Democrats in Syria? And promote uh, the removal the the removal of a regime that has to go. Right, that's your question, and um, uh, and for a variety of reasons, um, uh, at this at this moment in time, uh, an you know uh, uh, the kind of humanitarian intervention that I'm talking about that I was talking about um, in this presentation uh, would be extraordinarily difficult uh, to execute successfully while preserving other critical uh, interests that the United States and other governments have around the world. And, um, and as far as I understand, um, and you can correct me on this, in fact, um, the, the Democrats in Syria are not looking for um, uh, an armed intervention from the international community. Um, and if I'm wrong about that, you should, you should let me know, but that's my understanding. Um, right now, um, the, the, in, in terms of this, the strength of the international response to what the Syrian government is doing, um, uh, could be greater. And it's been, I think it's been, uh, some of those efforts have been thwarted to a great extent by uh, governments that have traditionally been close to the government of Syria, such as Russia, and have made it much more difficult for agreement on collective action uh, in the Security Council and other fora. I think the only, the only answer to your question is 
governments like the government of the United States has to keep plugging away, have to keep plugging away at it, have to tr do everything they can to keep the pressure on. And I think, I think in fairness to um, the United States government, I think those efforts have been serious and substantial. I think the efforts of Ambassador Robert Ford in Syria were unusually uh, um, activist. Uh, and I think he made clear to the Syrian people and to the Syrian government where the sympathies of the government of the United States um, are. So I, I think that by all means, Syrian Democrats should continue not only to, 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 to urge the international community to do much more, but at this particular moment, I think, for a variety of reasons to which I've just alluded, I think the kind of humanitarian intervention, military intervention that we that I've just alluded to, at least in the, you know, in the in the, in the you know in, in the immediate future, I think there've been well, there've been. Let me put it this way: I don't want to talk about the future. <laughs> what I'll say is, I think there've been obstacles to the kind of intervention that I've been talking about in this in, in, in this presentation today. But I think, Franklin, I think if the situation in Syria continues along the lines that it has. I think calls for some much more serious um, uh, uh, intervention will emerge, um, and I think there'll be greater and greater pressures in those regard. In that regard, actually, we have call from the ground, and we have many YouTube videos about the demonstration asking for six months now to intervention because children killed, women is raped, and we have no other option, just intervention. And we have now the National Council, who are representing by Burhan Galyun, asking many times for intervention, and all the world keeps silent. And we know that we have the UN, International uh, Secur uh, UN, uh, Security Council, but you know, Russia is supporting the regime 100%, and it's blocked away. The only hope that you have the other option as USA, and you can send NATO to risk to help those people who killed every moment. I think as the, I don't, I don't want to, um, as, as I said before, I think um, calls for uh, uh, intervention are likely to intensify. I think if, if the international community is prepared to consider, if the United States is prepared to consider that sort of option, there's no question in my mind that it, it, is, it would be a more effective option if it is done in, in, in a concert with other governments uh, in the region and around the world. Um, um, but, um, but, it, but I'm not the President of the United States. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even in the government. But at this point, given the way in which the, si the situation in Syria uh, has deteriorated, I don't think the United States or other governments should, should take any options off the table in terms of what they're prepared to do to try to promote change in Syria. Uh, Tom Hansen, diplomat in residence at University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, I think that the Libya-Syria contrast is, is so relevant to the current state of R2P because um, I think it illustrates how the principles we're trying to adopt, and I favor the adoption of R2P, um, is constantly going to be impacted by the geopolitical realities, the national interests. I mean, we're not living, unfortunately, in a world of principles, to the extent we would wish. Um, Libya was not central to the concerns of the great powers, uh, nor to the Arab League. And it was the Arab League uh, joining this effort that allowed uh, the resolutions to go forward. And that's what's lacking right now for the moment at least, in Syria. And the fact that China and Russia demurred was a very unusual um, circumstance. And I wonder now, well, two things. I think many people are seeing what's happening in Syria as part of a general uh, evolving confrontation on a regional basis between Sunni and Shia forces. The Turkish foreign minister warned against this recently. In Bahrain, in Iraq, we see these developing. So it is a powder keg in Syria. And to apply some of these principles uh, in the face of this uh, is going to be very difficult. Russia is supporting Syria, but they are claiming that it was the Libya precedent that ruined R2P. They're, cl they're claiming they were lied to about the resolution. 
uh, President Medvedev has said, we agreed uh, uh, to intervene, but not to an extended bombing campaign. That this came after the fact. Now, of course, they may be using this as a reason not to, to join, but do you think the way Libya was handled has undermined our two people? Well, first, let me, let me address your first, um, your first uh, uh, question, uh, Tom. I, I, don't, I, don't think, um, you know, I don't think your inability to, um, um, to apply principle, you know, apply principle, uh, I, I don't think your, your inability to act uh, in precisely the same manner uh, across all situations uh, when, when your capacity is constrained by a range of other legitimate factors involving geopolitics. I think the worst mistake to make is to throw your principles out the window when you confront that reality. The fact that the circumstances, the, the regional circumstances, the geopolitical circumstances surrounding Syria um, have created different pressures and dynamic, and a different dynamic uh, than the circumstance in Libya. Doesn't mean that the principles of the responsibility to protect shouldn't continue to inform our actions. Um, because after all, um, if, the, if the goal is, if the realizable goal is to save lives, you do it where, where you can. Um, your second point, um, it's, it's a tough question, but, but I, I, I think that, um, and, 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 I, and, I, and I suspect that much of the Russian argument is a pretext, because they knew what was going on. Um, but I, I think if your objective is to save civilian lives, pursuant to the R2P principles. Um, uh, I, I think if you were to intervene to stop the march on Benghazi, and then you stopped it, and then you left, then the march would have resumed. And so if you're, if you're not prepared to think about the longer term uh, uh, requirements to ensure that your initial objectives have been uh, fully realized, then you shouldn't go in in the first place. Um, you know, uh, um, and, and I think you have to deal with, you end up having to deal with uh, the, the challenges like the ones the Russians have offered. I think the key, there I would go back to the issue of intention, right? The starting point is intention, but I don't think your intention dictates all of the uh, follow-up action, if you will, that one has to take. I don't think anyone thinks that the intervention, I, I don't think anyone credibly believes that the intervention in Libya was a pretext uh, to remove the government. I think, the, in my own view, uh, the intervention in Libya was necessary to safeguard the lives of thousands of people. Um, and then, of course, it, it, it has its own, once that happens, it has its own dynamic. And I think as long as you continue to be informed by the principles that guide R2P, I think that, that, that enables you to take additional measures. And I'm familiar with the critiques. I've seen uh, David Reif's uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, argument about this, or, uh, uh, and, um, and I, ju I just, you know, I just, I don't, I don't agree. Tyler Zabriski from the American Refugee Committee. And I wondered uh, if, if you'd be willing to broaden the discussion to, to address Somalia, obviously a difficult uh, failed state situation with peacekeeping resources, but, but under-resourced and, and now very complex with the interventions of, of uh, Kenya and Ethiopia. Um, Well, there I think two issues come into play. Um, you know, there I think um, 
And the issue of intervention in Somalia has to do of the, th of the, of the three um, elements uh, of intervention that I articulated, um, uh, uh, capacity, will, and legitimacy. There, I think, uh, will certainly uh, plays a role in terms of our own country's um, legacy uh, in, in that part of the world. But I think capacity plays a role as well. I think um, um, uh, the history of military uh, interventions in Somalia by quite capable and powerful governments is not a happy one. And um, uh, so, and I'm very, and I, you know, I'm very skeptical about uh, the ultimate impact of foreign military interventions uh, from within the region. Um, so I don't have a good answer to your question. I didn't have a good answer when I was working in government, and I don't have a good answer now. Um, um, you know, I think that um, um, I think there has to be an effort. I don't. I don't think the United States and other governments have any choice but to to, to promote an effort to try to uh, support um, uh, indigenous uh, uh, institutions in Somalia. But that experience has been a very challenging one, um, and um, and and um, and there are been enormous obstacles to success, uh, but I, I think, I, I'm not sure we have an alternative but to do that and to continue to try to promote opportunities to get assistance in. Um, and I think that we've seen some successes in efforts and, uh, that aren't necessarily efforts to fight one's way in, but rather to negotiate one's, one's way in. And of course, it's critically important to try to do that without sacrificing humanitarian principles, but I think there's been some success in that regard, and to continue to provide refuge to people who flee. Um, but, um, I, you know, uh, um, some problems, <coughs> many problems, don't have um, you know, comprehensive solutions that are right in front of us. this principle of the responsibility to protect really for um, people who are fortunate enough to live in countries like Libya where the regime had become a pariah. Um, I'm thinking of situations such as the situation of Tibetans in China or Chechnyans in Russia. And I'd like to ask you to comment on that. Thank well, you. Uh, you know, uh, Mary, I don't think I can say much more than what I said to Tom, except what I would say, in addition to what I said to Tom, is that um, my own view is that, um, you know, my, my own view is that, that, um, that even in circumstances where, for whatever reason, uh, the international uh, community uh, is not prepared um, uh, to um, intervene, um, militarily, um, I would make I would make two points. First, um, I, I I think that um, that uh, the more a principle like this one, norm like this one, is developed and entrenched, the more circumstances in which it seems to me um, it becomes feasible in circumstances that in a previous time were less feasible. Um, and, and, but the second, the second point, I think, is also, the second point is also an important one, which is that even in circumstances where um, the, even in circumstances where the international community isn't prepared to intervene robustly, I think these principles can and do affect um, the decisions of political leaders. Um, uh, in Sri Lanka, at the end of the conflict, um, the, uh, all evidence suggests that the 
um, that the violence that, were, that was perpetrated against Tamil, Tamil civilians in the end game to that conflict a couple of years ago was pretty dramatic and, and pretty awful. Uh, and the international community was not, for a variety of reasons, was not going to be prepared, was, was, did, not, did not take action to stop it. Um, you can bemoan that fact, but, the, but I also think that the pressure that the international community uh, put on the government of Sri Lanka in the aftermath of that uh, terrible event, and I would also argue that the um, increased awareness of these principles, international human rights principles, um, may have played a role in the government's relatively rapid decision uh, to release from internment uh, 300,000 Tamil civilians who were in ID, IDP camps uh, in the north. And, and so you know, I think you have to kind of um, accept the fact that this is an uncertain process and one that moves forward very incrementally. Question. Um, we've heard about your discussion of, of past, looking back the past uh, decade or so. Looking ahead into the future, um, could you perhaps um, give us some idea of what your thoughts are as who would be the enforcer of this legitimacy versus authority um, balancing if the Security Council continues with its current membership if the U.S. is cutting its military forces, and if Western Europe, made up of NATO, is in a less strong economic position to provide resources for future peacekeeping. I'm sorry, I didn't identify myself. Dean Montgomery, thank you. That was a three-part question, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, um, my, my own view of this is that, um, is that, with the, you know, some of the factors you're describing um, come out of inevitable shifts in um, resources and diffusion of power in the world. Um, uh, again, much of which is inevitable. Um, we are seeing a massive, for example, transfer of wealth from the West to the East by, in the next 20 or 30 years, um, the countries of Brazil, Russia, India, and China will, um, will have more GDP than the G7 has. Um, and um, so it's, it is inevitable that, there, that, that the world is changing. And um, it seems to me that we have, uh, it, it, let me put it into a binary choice. Um, we can, we can, um, uh, take the view that um, against, you know, with respect, that in disregard of these forces, you know, we will try to uh, go it alone. To, if, there's a, if there's a problem in the world, we will solve it. If, there's a, if there are people suffering in the world, uh, the United, and, and there's, a, there's a call to go in, um, the United States will do it. We could, uh, we can, we could take that approach. Um, but but given the world that you know that, that we live in now and that we're going to live in 30 years ago, it's an approach that will be destined uh, for failure. Alternatively, we can manage, we can we can try to manage the changes that are uh, uh, inevitable in ways that bring new government um, that, that in ways that strengthen our ties uh, to other governments and international organizations that promote good citizenship by other governments, um, and that, uh, that work within these institutions to try to develop kind of shared understandings of what, um, of, of, of what our responses collectively are going to be to the challenges we face. I think if we don't do that, um, we are going to see the evolution of a United States norms that are, that are accepted by the United States, Europe, and a handful of other countries in the world. And, 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 and other perspectives. And so our goal, our, our goal has to be 
to try to bring this together. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks very much for all of you.